Today we're going to read Mr. Ferris and His Wheel, and it's written by Katherine Gibbs Davis, and it's illustrated by Gilbert Ford. Do you remember him? He wrote the incredible thing that came from a spring. Um, so he is the illustrator. So Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. Uh, do you like to go on those? I know some people love them and some people hate them. Um, and I'm going to read the quote on the back. It says, I determined that the engineering profession should be represented by something that would stand as a monument. George Ferris Jr. Oh, I wonder if his last name is the reason why we call it a Ferris wheel. Mr. Ferris, well, okay, that makes sense. I get it now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ferris and his wheel. It was only 10 months until the next World's Fair, but everyone was still talking about the star attraction of the last World's Fair. At 81 stories, Francis Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. Its pointy iron and air tower soared so high that visitors could see, or to the, wait, so high that visitors to the top could see Paris in one breathtaking sweep. Completed in 1889, the Eiffel Tower stood at 986 feet, surpassing America's Washington Monument to become the world's tallest man-made structure. So we're talking 1889, you know, our buildings are much taller than, than this today. Uh, maybe you've seen the Eiffel Tower that's at Kings Island. That's a recreation of the real thing. The real one is much larger. Um, and there are three observation decks. You can go to the lower level, upper level, and then the very top. Um, so when I was in Paris, I only got to the second level because I was a college student that didn't have a lot of money. It took a lot to get there. So I didn't have enough to go all the way to the top, which is probably a good thing since I'm scared of heights. But I wish I would. You know, I wish I would have. So hopefully one day when I can go back. <laughs> Now it was America's turn to impress the world at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. But what could outshine the famous French Tower and who would build it? A nationwide contest was announced. Before TV and the internet, people from around the globe gathered at World's Fairs to share their different ways of life and new technologies. Tasty inventions such as hamburgers and Cracker Jack first appeared here. So there's a guy selling the the Chicago Tribune, and it says World World's Fair contest, World's Fair contest. Get your paper. Get the World's Fair contest. Get your paper. <laughs> so it says fair judge say judge judges say no. Contest drawings poured in from around the country, but most of the plans looked like the Eiffel Tower, only bigger. The fair judges said no to every last one. Was this really the best that American engineers could muster? To an, ambitious, to an ambitious young civil engineer, this contest was more than a dare. It was a matter of national pride. George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. had already designed some of the country's biggest bridges, tunnels, and roads. He could never allow a French tower to overshadow America's World's Fair. Why hadn't the United States built the world's first skyscraper? George had seen the elegant steel frame rise 10 stories high with his own eyes. Supported by a metal frame in, instead of solid walls, Chicago's home insurance building was the world's first skyscraper. Bird cages were the inspiration for the metal frame. So that's kind of cool to be able to see, you know, some of the beginnings of buildings. George had an idea, an idea for a structure that would dazzle and move, not just stand still like the Eiffel Tower. Back at his drawing board in Pittsburgh, he and his engineering partner, William Granu, measured and remeasured. A mistake of even an inch could bring their invention crashing down. Hmm. So, you know, we talk about measurement a lot in science and you know, it is very important to have precise measurements. Did you hear that? If it was off by even an inch when they built the real thing, 
it could be a disaster. It could crash down. So, um, you know, these things that we, we try to talk about, you know, like no naked numbers, you know, we always have to have unit measurement with it. Um, that's because, you know, if you were to do one of these jobs one day, those things are super duper important. So we're trying to learn um, to pay attention to details like that because you might have to use that one day. <laughs> All right, George arrived in Chicago and made his case to the construction chief at, of the fair. The chief stated, I'm sorry, the chief stared at George's drawings. No one had ever created a fair attraction that huge and complicated. The chief told George that his structure was so flimsy it would collapse. George had heard enough. He rolled up his drawings and said, you are an architect, sir. I am an engineer. George knew something the chief did not. His invention would be delicate looking and strong. It would be both stronger and lighter than the Eiffel Tower because it would be built with an amazing new metal, steel. All right, so he said that he is an engineer, but this guy's an architect. Do you know the difference? Hmm. What are, what is the difference? The key difference between an architect and an engineer is that an architect focuses more on the artistry and design of the building, while the engineer focuses more on the technical and structural side. So if you think about an architect, looks at what the building is gonna look like, how it's set up, and the engineer is focused on, is this gonna hold it all? What do I need to put in place to make sure it's strong and will work? George was a steel expert and his structure would be made of steel alloy. Alloys combine a super strong mix of hard metal with two or more chemical elements. The judges could not decide. Fall turned to winter as they dilly-dallied. That means they kind of took their time. In only four months, the fair would open and it still had no star attraction. Finally, desperate, they agreed to give George's far-fetched idea a try but they would not give him one penny for the materials to build it. The clock was ticking. George dashed from bank to bank asking for help. But when he began describing his invention, lenders laughed him into the street. So George used his own savings and convinced a wealth and a few and convinced a few wealthy investors to join him. Still short of money, he boldly went ahead and ordered the parts he needed from a dozen different steel, steel mills. So look at him, he is going all over town trying to get money so he can build his Ferris wheel. George and his brave workers kept frantically digging. Sorry. George and his um, steel workers, or his brave workers kept frantically digging. Finally, 35 feet down, they hit solid ground. They planned two huge, they planted two huge steel towers deep into the earth, bolted them to crossbars of steel and poured in cement to hold it all in place. Then they carefully lowered a 70 ton axle with fittings, the weight of a module locomotive train between them. This sturdy structure would hold the gigantic invention steady and even the strongest Chicago winds. At 45 feet long, the axle, a metal rod, was the largest piece of steel ever forged. And, boy, and a boy helped to hammer it into shape at the Bethlehem Ironworks. So look at that, they're getting it all ready. As time grew shorter, freight trains from all over the country chugged onto the fairgrounds loaded with more than 100,000 parts. Workers hurried to fit all the pieces together like a giant Lego toy. Hammers pounded nonstop in the breathless race to finish. Responsible for the wheel's many structure, structural details, George's partner was losing hope. It's undignified. Stand back, dear, it might collapse. Betcha the wind will blow Ferris's folly into the lake. No, it'll fall first. It's going up way too fast. They say Ferris has wheels in his head. 
So are people supporting him? <laughs> Not at all. Finally, with only two months left, the last section was bolted into place. And there stood a perfect, enormous circle, 834 feet in circumference, rising 265 feet above the ground, and designed to move with the precision of the smallest watch. It looks exactly how George had first imagined it back as a boy on his ranch in Nevada. Living near the shore of Nevada's Carson River, George had often watched the water wheel turn around and around. Many times he had imagined shrinking to the size of one of his toy soldiers and hitching a ride up, up and away in one of his wooden buckets. In one of its wooden buckets. So a water wheel is what inspired his Ferris wheel. Very interesting. Still, the biggest test was yet to come. The monster wheel had to spin. And George's elegant pas passenger cars still had to be hung. The tireless crew worked day and night to attach them. Each was the size of a living room with enorm enormous picture windows and 40 velvet seats. George's wheel worked like a bicycle wheel. Both are supported by skinny, flexible rods called spokes. As the wheel turns, the spokes work together to share the weight. These are called tension wheels. On June 21st, 1893, opening day finally arrived. 2,000 people gathered as flags waved. George took the stage and dedicated his wheel to the noble profession of engineering. Then George's wife presented him with a beautiful golden whistle. George and his wife stepped proudly into car number one, followed by their nervous but excited guests. Uniformed guards closed and locked the door. Would the wheel work? Those people are willing to be the guinea pigs. They're willing to try it out first. That's awesome. Uh, George blew the golden whistle. 2,000 tons of steel began to turn around as the soft clanking of a large chain drove the mighty machine. Up, 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 the car quietly floated above the mud and noise. Two steam engines, an extra one in case one broke, made the wheel turn. George had hidden them under the wooden platform where riders boarded. So that's kind of similar to, you know, a Ferris wheel that you would see today. Um, usually all of that stuff is under the ground or under where you're walking. As the car was lifted higher, everyone rose from the velvet seats and crowded to the windows. Spread out below them was a dizzying sweep of the fairgrounds, the city of Chicago and sparkling Lake Michigan. And even glimpses of three faraway states. Below, more cars were loaded, and after the people had gone two times around and had 20 glorious airborne minutes in motion, powerful brakes brought the wheel to a whisper soft stop. When the conductor called, all out, everyone begged to go around again. The wheel is safe. The news raced through the fairgrounds, through the, through the city of Chicago, and across the country. Yeah, it's kind of scary to think about being the first person on an amusement ride. Uh, all summer, visitors from around the world traveled to Chicago, to the Chicago's World Fair. It didn't matter whether one was a senator, a farmer, a boy, or a girl. Everyone wanted to take a spin on the magnificent wheel. Adventurous couples asked to get married on it. On hot, steamy days, the wheel was the perfect place to escape up, up, up into the cooling breezes. All you needed was 50 cents. During the 19 weeks that the wheel was in operation, 1.5 million passengers rode it. It revolved more than 10,000 times, withstood gale force winds and storms, and did not need one repair. So he was able to balance those forces, but obviously turn it on, you know, with an engine um, to be able to make it spin and go around. So that's pretty awesome. At night, George Ferris's wheel became a magical glowing circle with 3,000 electric light bulbs and another brand new invention. Oh, wait, another brand new invention. As the Queen of the Midway made its state, stately rotation, so did the seasons. Soon, a fall chill filled the air and fair visitors began to thin out. 
In the late 1800s, homes were still lit with candles and kerosene lamps. The Chicago World's Fair helped reassure people that electricity was safe. At night, farmers and sailors from as far away as 40 miles could see the wheel's spectacular blaze of lights. On October 26, 1893, just before midnight, the immense twinkling spinning circle slowed to its final stop. The Chicago World's Fair was over. George had called his creation a monster wheel, but his investors renamed it after its inventor, the Ferris wheel. So investors are people that give money to somebody who has an idea, like an entrepreneur, somebody who wants to create something or sell to, to sell. Like, and in this instance, it was like a service to go on that. So the Chicago Fair or the White City inspired two more, more magical places, the Emerald City in the classic children's book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum and Disneyland. Walt Disney's father was a construction worker on the fair. He told his son stories about the dreamlike city he had helped build, and young Walt grew up to build a famous amusement, build famous amusement parks that would stay open all year round. Yeah, I know a lot of people like to go to Disney World in Florida, or they want to go to Disneyland in California, or want to go to amusement park. Or some people are like, nope keep you away. I don't like any of those. So um, me, I like them. I think they're fun, but not everybody likes it. Today, Ferris wheels are the most familiar and beloved carnival ride at the state fairs and amusement parks. A ride on one still feels like flying to the moon and ooh, 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 the view. So since 1893, there have been several tallest ever Ferris wheels and the race continues with the proposed new record holders for the world's tallest including the New York wheel, that was 630 feet, and the Dubai Eye, 690 feet. And it looks like this book does not have an author's note or anything like that, but it does have an official photograph of George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. And it was taken from the Chicago's World's Fair pamphlet and he was 34 years old. So if that's something that interests you is learning about this, I would definitely encourage you to look it up, look up the history of the Ferris wheel, but um, maybe it makes you wonder about some other amusement park rides that you like, and you can learn about the history of them too. The World's Columbian Exposition, also known as the Chicago World's Fair, was a World's Fair held in Chicago in 1893 to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World in 1492. It included carnival rides, among them the original Ferris wheel, built by George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. This wheel was 264 feet high and had 36 cars, each of which could accommodate 40 people. One of the attendees later credited the sights he saw on the Chicago Midway for inspiring him to create America's first major amusement park, Steeplechase Park in Coney Island. I hope you enjoyed learning about the world's first Ferris wheel. That's all for me. Take care. Peace.